Okay, welcome to Family Bible Time. We are on a weary Sunday evening. We're in Numbers 25. Numbers 25. And we are also in Psalm 68. Psalm 68, those of you who know, in the Messiah... And the Lord gave the word, great mm-hmm. were the company mm-hmm. of the, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. those. And you're going to, if you know the Mas- Handel's Messiah, mm-hmm. you're going to recognize that. And there's a messianic uh, verse or two to do with the ascension. Verse 18, you ascended on high, leading a host of captives in your train. Wow, that crops up in the New Testament. Baal, uh, son, n- numbers. <laughs> Numbers 24. Um, Numbers 25 is one of those pivotal chapters that's going to be referred to again and again by God. God brings up this sin. It is quite fearful to think that you can sin in a way which is notable and, and God would think about that mm. in connection with your history Baal uh, numbers 25 let's pray <coughs> thank you lord for this time around your word we pray for your help pray that you would um please strengthen us and help us and teach us mm. now lord you know um our need, you know, the strength that we need, you know, the help that we need to, to understand this rightly. In Jesus' name, please give it. Mm. Amen. Amen. When Israel lived in Shittim, now Shittim was the place just across the Jordan River from Jericho, so the other side, on the plains of Moab. When Israel, Israel lived in Shittim, the people began to whore with the daughters of Moab. Well done. I don't think we're in any danger. (laughs) These invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods. And the people ate and bowed down to their gods. Can you imagine this? This this is the people of Israel. These are the people now who've been wandering in the wilderness all these years. Think of it, and uh, and they they've come to you could say the end of their journey, uh, and yet they're they're still just unfaithful to God. Mm. And you remember, of course, that Balaam had. We read this in Revelation chapter two and the letter to the church in Pergamum when Jesus says you have those among you um, who engage in the sin of Balaam, son of Beor, who caused Israel to sin. Mm -hmm. So when when he provoked, uh, he he taught Balak to tempt Israel into sin by getting them to commit sexual immorality with, with the daughters of the Moabites. So, and this, but this was also mixed up with idolatry. So they, they, were, they were being sexually immoral with the daughters of Moab, but they were bringing them along to the sacrifices of their gods. And the people of Israel were engaging in these idolatrous feasts where they actually (coughs) ate and bowed down to their gods. So how provoking is that to God? Mm. How provoking is that to God? I'm just going to put this in context for us now. Just can you imagine how provoking it is to God when people who grow up knowing the Bible, then get involved in sexual immorality. I remember listening to the son of a very famous preacher recently 
And this son of this very famous preacher has walked away from the Lord and has become a star on the internet because he's just telling people why they don't need to believe in God. And one of the things he said to people was, you know, relax, go and have sex and just enjoy yourselves. Now, I just want to highlight this. This is, imagine how provoking to God it is when someone who knows all that does that. I mean, this is, this is what the people of Israel are doing now, isn't it? So, verse 3, so Israel yoked himself to Baal of Peor, that's the name of the God, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and the Lord said to Moses, take all the chiefs of the people and hang them in the sun before the Lord, that the fierce anger of the Lord may turn away from Israel. Now, if you didn't know what what was so bad about it, you might think, whew, <clears throat> actually, it's pretty amazing when you think of what they're doing. It's amazing that the ground didn't swallow up and swallow them all up, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Or that there wasn't some terrible plague immediately that just killed them all. Anyway, there was a plague. Verse 5, And Moses said to the judges of Israel, Each of you kill those of his men who have yoked themselves to Baal of Peor. Now, um, verse 6 tells us about something that happened kind of, I guess, whilst all this was going on. And behold, one of the people of Israel came and brought a Midianite woman to his family in the sight of Moses and in the sight of the whole congregation of the people of Israel while they were weeping in the entrance of the tent of meeting. So all the people are there, they're, they're realizing this is dreadful, that so, so some of the people are off committing adultery with these women and worshipping at the pagan idol feasts and the, the godly ones are weeping and mm. crying out to the Lord by the tent of meeting. But then along comes this man and right in front of them all, mm. he's leading a woman to his tent. And you mm. can imagine what they were probably best not to imagine, but you can kind of know what they were going to do in the tent. When Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, saw it, he rose and left the congregation and took a spear in his hand and went after the man of Israel into the chamber and pierced both of them, the man of Israel and the woman through her belly. Wow. Well, that's pretty graphic, isn't it? Oh. Two with one strike, you could say. Uh -huh. Thus the plague on the people of Israel was stopped. Nevertheless, those who died by the plague were 24,000. Then the Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, the priest, has turned back my wrath from the people of Israel, and that he was jealous with my jealousy among them, so that I did not consume the people of Israel in my jealousy. Therefore say, Behold, I give to him my covenant of peace, and it shall be to him and to his descendants after him the covenant of a perpetual priesthood, because he was jealous for his God and made atonement for the people of Israel. The name of the slain man of Israel who was killed with the Midianite woman was Zimri, the son of Zal Salu, chief of a father's house belonging to the Simeonites. And the name of the Midianite woman who was killed was Cosby, the, son of, the daughter of Zer, <laughs> who was the tribal head of a father's house in Midian. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Harass the Midianites and strike them down, for they have harassed you with their wiles, with which they beguiled you in the matter of Peor, in the matter of Cosby, the daughter of the chief of Midian. 
their sister who was killed on the day of the plague on account of Peor. Mm. So it's a small chapter, but a big sin. Now, um, just to kind of put this out there, people sometimes get very... I suppose they get offended mm. when someone is zealously jealous for God's glory and God's honour. Mm. I guess if you could say, what did Phineas do that 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 pleased the Lord. You think, think think of this. I mean, he took a spear in his hand, and he went and killed two people with it. Mm. And and God mentions him by name and says, "You you get to be a perpetual priesthood because of this." So this is really significant. What Phineas did really pleased the Lord. Why? Well, because Phineas was really concerned. When it says jealous, it doesn't mean envious of. It doesn't mean he wanted God's glory. It meant he was very concerned that, about God's glory. He saw God being dishonoured, and he thought, I have got to do something. Let me grab a spear. Everyone else is kind of crying and doing nothing. He grabs a spear, and he goes and does something. And God says, okay. And the plague was stopped. Now, lesson for us, let's grab a spear and... No, 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 don't do that. Okay, do not stock up on spears. But, but do, what, what's the lesson for us? Do have a concern for God's glory. What? What do you think when people come in to worship God in church and they're playing about? What do you think? They're not really interested. All right, I think they're not really interested. And that makes me sad. But something upsets me. Why? Well, because we're coming to worship God. This is serious. Someone comes in and they're just playing. Hang on a minute. We're here to worship God. Do you, can, can, you, can you get a little bit of this holy jealousy for God's glory? What about when people take the Bible and they just make jokes out of it? They make fun of it. Now, I'm not talking about what we do. I'm hoping... I'm hoping none of what we do is irreverent when we have fun with people's names. But there are, there are people who will, who will make fun of the Bible and of God. Now, and, and now, I'm not suggesting that we go and be like the militant Muslims who kill people who dishonour the Prophet. Muhammad, or the who who blaspheme against the Quran or something. So, I, I, let me get that get that straight. I don't think this story gives us any license to do that kind of thing. Mm. But what this does do is say that so that actually, yeah, there is such a thing as there's a right thing. It's a right thing to be really concerned for God's glory and honour and really upset when God is dishonoured. And, and it doesn't give, we're not Israel, we're not living in a theocracy, it doesn't give us the right to punish people who are sinning sexually or who are committing idolatry. We, none of that applies to us. But it should give us a holy concern when God is being dishonoured in such a terrible way. That's about as far as I can go, right? Psalm 68. Now, um, I, I read this, I listened, listened to it last night, 
and listen to it again today a couple of times. You can let her in. Um, I read it. Hey, hey lie down, Ailey. Lie down. Um, my brain is tired, and I, I'm really struggling to to really get my head around this psalm. So I'll give you the best shot that I can give you. I I read the MacArthur Study Bible. Uh, I'm afraid with my tired brain it wasn't making sense to me. I couldn't see the structure that um, was being given there. Uh, and I read the... This is uh, MacArthur... McVarner's. This is, <laughs> this is William Varner's commentary, Awake, O Heart. Um, and he gives a different structure to MacArthur and I think I'm not sure that I could get my head around all of it but it seemed a lot simpler to me so he gives a structure and, and I'm kind of I was kind of relieved when I read this because I thought I'm just not getting this psalm <laughs> and then his title for the psalm is the most difficult of all <laughs> and he says the genius of 20th century biblical scholars W.F. Albright wrote that Psalm 68 has always been considered with justice as with justice as the most difficult of all the psalms but then Dr. Varner says this perhaps the problem lies more with the scholars than the devoted reader First, we should closely read this, the longest psalm we've encountered in our trek through the Psalter. See if you can discern the so-called many problems. My guess is that you won't. Now, I'll agree with that, but also say um, I'm just going to give you his outline because I'm not sure that I can give you my own. So Psalm 68, here we go, to the choir master, a psalm of David, a song. God shall arise, his enemies shall be scattered, and those who hate him shall flee before him. Do you, do you, do you recognise that from the book of Numbers? Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. When did they say that? Well, you should be saying, ooh, ooh, ooh. But you're not, are you? Is that Balaam's last No, 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 no. This there? is Numbers like 11 mm -hmm. or something like that. It's when the, when the ark set out. Every time the ark set out, let God arise and his enemies be scattered and then return, O Lord, mm. to the thousands upon thousands of Israel. Do you remember that? Mm. Okay. Um, well, this is a bit like that, isn't it? This is, and yeah, it's a psalm of David. And that, I think, amongst other things, makes people think that it's perhaps... A psalm of jubilation when David finally settled the ark and brought the ark back to its resting place. Anyway, as smoke is driven away, so you shall drive them away. As wax melts before fire, so the wicked shall perish before God. But the righteous shall be glad, they shall exult before God, they shall be jubilant with joy. Sing to God, sing praises to his name, lift up a song to him who rides through the deserts. His name is the Lord, exalt before him, father of the fatherless and protector of widows, is God in his holy habitation. I want to say, is he, is that the old A.V.? Oh, you don't know. Anyway. God settles the solitary in a home. Don't you just love this God? Mm. Don't you love God? This is our God, the one who is the protect, father of the fatherless and protector of widows. And he settles the solitary in a home. <laughs> couldn't, you, couldn't you say, I mean, maybe you're solitary. And you, you're saying, would God do this for me? This is God. Okay, that's what we've got here is God's character. This is the kind of thing God does. And he does it enough that he has a name for it. Could you entrust your future to him? Mm. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity. But the rebellious dwell in a parched land. 
O oh God, when you went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth quaked, the heavens poured down rain. Before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel, rain in abundance, O oh God, you shed abroad. You restored your inheritance as it languished. Your flock found a dwelling in it. In your goodness, O oh God, you provided for the needy. The Lord gives the word. Here's the verse from the Messiah. The women who announce the news are a great host. How's it go in the King James? Great was the company of the women that announced it, or something like that, anyway. I don't recognize it. I won't sing it for you. It would be embarrassing. <laughs> anyway, the kings of the armies, they flee, they flee. The women at home divide the spoil. Though you men lie among the sheepfolds, the wings of a dove covered with silver, its pinions with shimmering gold, when the Almighty scatters kings there, let snow fall on Zalmon. O oh, mountain of God, O oh, mountain of Bashan, O oh, many peak mountain, mountain of Bashan, why do you look with hatred, O oh, many peak mountain, at the mountain that God desired for his abode? Yes, where the Lord will dwell forever. This is kind of the other mountains looking at Zion and being jealous. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the chariots of God are twice 10,000. Now this is verse 17 and 18. Dr. Varna divides it up into verses 1 to 16, the victorious nation. Let me give you what he says. Great victories were nothing new to Israel, for God had been with them from the beginning. He had delivered them from Egypt, he led them through the wilderness into the promised land. He gave them Mount Zion and dwelt with them there. What a history of victory. Have you reviewed lately all that God has done for you? And this mm. is kind of the, them reviewing what God had done for them and all the victories that God had done. But then verses 17 and 18 he says, refer to the victorious saviour and notes that Paul quoted verse 18 in Ephesians 4, 8 and applied it to the ascension of Jesus. So let's just read this, 17 and 18. The chariots of God are twice 10,000, thousands upon thousands. The Lord is among them. Sinai is now in the sanctuary. You ascended on high leading a host of captives in your train and receiving gifts among men, even among the rebellious, that the Lord God may dwell there. All right, verses 19 to 35 is the last section, which he calls the victorious singers. The happy procession reached the sanctuary where they lifted their voices, their praises to God and asked for his continued strength as new enemies attacked. The God of past victories would not forsake them as they trusted him and obeyed his will. Okay, let's read it. Verse 19. Blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. Selah. Our God is a God of salvation and to God the Lord belong deliverances from death. But God will strike the heads of his enemies, the hairy crown of him who walks in his guilty ways. That's a quite the profound description, isn't it? The hairy crown of him who walks in his guilty ways. Mm -hmm. The Lord said, I will bring them back from Bashan. I will bring them back from the depths of the sea, that you may strike your feet in their blood, and that the tongues of your dogs may have their portion from the foe. Your procession is seen, O God, the procession of my God, my King, into the sanctuary. The singers in front, the musicians last, between them virgins playing tambourines. Bless God in the great congregation. O Lord, O you who are of Israel's fountain, there is Benjamin, the least of them in the lead, the princes of Judah in their throng, the princes of Zebulun, the princes of Naphtali, Summon your power, O God, the power by, of O God by which you worked for us. Because of your temple at Jerusalem, kings shall bear gifts to you. 
Rebuke the beasts that dwell among the reeds, the herds of bulls with the calves of the peoples. Trample underfoot those who lust after tribute. Scatter the peoples who delight in war. Nobles shall come from Egypt. Cush shall hasten and stretch out her hands to God. O kingdoms of the earth, sing to God. Sing praises to the Lord, Selah. To him who rides in the heavens, the ancient heavens, behold, he sends out his voice, his mighty voice. Ascribe power to God, whose majesty is over Israel, whose power is in the skies. Awesome is God from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. Mm. All right, now, um, as I said to start with, I don't think I can give you like a coherent um, summary of the psalm or a, a, I don't think I'm capable of kind of summing up the message of this psalm except to say it is exuberant praise to God on behalf of his victories that he's granted to his people and maybe the ascension is in view and maybe um, this is kind of looking at the way in which, I suppose prophetically looking at the way in which God is to be praised for the, the great victory which he's going to bring about. Beyond that, um, the, I think probably the most helpful thing I can say is, is to <laughs> suggest to you to do sometimes what I have to do when I can't get the whole picture and this is daily Bible study, and, and you can't, I mean, I've read it several times, I've read the MacArthur study Bible notes, I've read this devotional commentary, and I just don't have the time or the energy to go and read detailed commentaries and work it all out. What do you do, by the way, when that's the case? Well, circle a couple of really great, great verses Get some nuggets from it and keep just keep reading and mm. pray that next time the Lord will give you more insight. Or maybe next time you'll be able to have time to read more detailed commentaries and get a better understanding of it. Okay, let's just look at these nuggets, shall we, quickly. Um, verse 35. Awesome is God from his sanctuary, the God of Israel. He is the one who gives power and strength to his people. Blessed be God. Mm. All right. Could you say, I feel the need for power and strength? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Where's it going to come from? This is going to come from God, isn't it? And our God. I mean, this is an exuberant psalm. This is right that we are exuberant because our God is great. We sang it since we, we sang it, sung it today. What did we sing? I don't think you sang that. Behold our oh, God. Behold God. Yes, behold our God. That's kind of a song of um that well we didn't sing our God is great, no, the Father of Creation. That, but that was last week, was it? So but today we sang Behold our God. And, and when you just think about the awesomeness of God, well, then you, then you can say, well, he, he's the one who gives strength to his people. And what about that verse in verse 5? Mm. Father of the fatherless, protector of widows, is God in his holy habitation. Verse 6, God settles the solitary in a home. He leads out the prisoners to prosperity. Now, th this is the kind of stuff... Verse 19, blessed be the Lord who daily bears us up. God is our salvation. These are the kind of verses that you can, I think, legitimately write on a, write on a postcard and stick it on your bathroom mirror. Or, um, mm. Get this into your head and just say, all right, I'm going to take that with me. If I can take nothing more, I'll take that. Mm. 
Lord, we thank you and praise you that we can take with us today that you are awesome in your sanctuary. And you are the God who gives power and strength to your people. We can rely upon you. Thank you that you settle the solitary in families. You're the protector of widows. Thank you that you daily bear us up. Thank you that we can, when we're weary, we can... <laughs> We can rest knowing that you are the one whose mercies are new every morning. And that we can look to you for strength for tomorrow, Lord. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're done. And we'll see you, God willing, tomorrow, if the Lord wills. And if we live another day. <laughs> we made it through another week. God bless you. Bye for now. <laughs>